Hi, I'm Fernando Pereira from UFMG, and today we continue our, our class about operational semantics. Before diving into this notion of operational semantics, however, we shall talk about a generalization of the principle of induction called structural induction. To explain what is structural induction, we shall prove several properties about a toy language. The language follows this grammar on the right. This grammar is given in some sort of Bacchus Naur form representation. You might have seen this representation before. Can you try to explain what is the meaning of this representation? In a way, a BNF grammar describes a set. The set of all the strings that belong into the language. This is an inductive definition of a set. We have a base case that is true, false, and zero. They belong into the set. Let's call the set T. Then if we have a term T1 in T, then suck T1, pred T1, and the zero T1 are all terms of T. And if we have that T1, T2, and T3 belong to T, then the expression if T1, then T2, else T3 also belongs to T. We can write this inductive definition using inference rules. Here they are, the inference rules. You can stop the video and take a look into the rules if you want to understand what they describe. Notice that the premise, that is the fact above the line, must be true so that the conclusion, that is the fact under the line, be also true. There are other ways to explain the semantics of the BNF grammar. For instance, we can associate a level with each term. The level gives us an idea of the size of that term. For instance, in the first level, call it S0, we have the empty set. Then we build a set in the level i plus 1 by forming terms with the elements in level i. Here's the definition of level i plus 1. Maybe you should stop the video and read these definitions. Now, could you try to show this theorem that at level i plus 1 contains all the terms in level i? We can prove the theorem using induction. We can use simple induction on the natural numbers, as each level is associated with a number. So, if we take i to be 0, then the statement must be true, because the nth set is in every set. Now, can you try to show that the theorem is true in, in general? How can you define your inductive case? We can assume by induction that sk minus 1 is in sk. Now, let's try to show that sk is in sk plus 1. In other words, we must show that for any term t in sk, this term is also in sk plus 1. We already know that there are three types of terms in sk. Here they are. So, can you try to reason about each one of these terms, these three expressions here, showing that if we the term is in sk, then it must also be in sk plus 1? The first term means that t is a constant. I'm talking about this term here. Then we are done, because by definition the constants are in all the sets. The second term is t equal to suck of t1. We know by definition that t1 is in sk minus 1. However, by induction, then t1 must be in sk. But if t1 is in sk, then suck t1 is in sk plus 1 by definition. The case for the conditional expression is similar, and you can reason about it if you want. So, now we have two meanings for a BNF grammar. They look rather different, but they encode the same strings. Look at these two definitions. Can you show that they represent the same set of strings? Or, in other words, how can we show that these definitions are equivalent? To prove that these two definitions are equivalent, we need to show 
these two facts. First, the set S from the right side definition satisfies the conditions in the left side definition. Second, any set that meets the conditions in the left side contains S. We will start showing that the first observation is true. T imposes three conditions on a set. The first is true for S. Because in Sn contains the three constants. Now let's show that S meets the other two conditions. We need to show that if T1 is in T, then suck T1 is in T, for instance. If T1 is in S, then it must belong in some Si. In this case, by the definition of Si plus 1, we know that suck T1 is in Si plus 1. And in this case, we know that suck T1 plus 1 is in S. Showing these facts for the other potential terms follow the same principles and I will not do that. Now, let's do the inverse. We will show that any set that satisfies the conditions of T contains S. Let's pick up a set S' prime that satisfies the three conditions. Notice that we are not assuming that S' prime is S. Not at all. This is what we want to show. We shall proceed with complete induction. Let's assume that up to a certain number i, every sj such that j is less than i is in s prime. This statement is true if i is zero, because in this case s i is the empty set which naturally is in s prime. So let's focus on a greater on i greater than zero. We want to show that s i plus one is in s prime. Given that every S i is in S prime and that S prime meets the conditions of set T. We know that S i plus 1 is the union of three sets. The first is the set of constants, true, false, and zero. But then S prime contains the set due to condition 1. Now S i plus 1 can also contain, for instance, suck T1, where T1 is in S i. In this case, we know that T1 is in S prime by induction. But the, the suck T1 is in S prime as well, due to condition 2. And we can use the same reasoning for the other shapes of terms in Si plus 1. So we have shown that any Si meets the conditions that define T, but S is the union of the sets, which all belong into S prime. Therefore, S must be a subset of S prime. Essentially, what we have been doing is a form of structural induction. This is the kind of induction that works on terms defined recursively. Recursive definitions of terms are very common in functional programming. For instance, here's the definition of our language in SML. And here's a function that finds all the constants in a term, for instance. Here's an example of its use. You can stop the video and read the definitions over to better understand what will follow up. Here's another definition, this time of the size of a term. Again, you can stop the video and think about these definitions. We'll be using them to illustrate how structural induction works. Finally, here's a third function that computes the depth of a term. Better yet, it actually defines what depth of a term is. Would you like again to stop the video and read these functions carefully? A kind of structural induction is called induction on terms. Basically, if we can show that some property is true for all the subterms, then we can show it to be true for the term itself. For instance, let's prove that the number of different constants in a term t is no greater than the size of t. Down here is the definition of the set of constants and the size of terms. How could we show this theorem then to be true? For the base case, we have three cases to consider. In all of them, the set of constants is a singleton, and the size of the term is exactly one. So the theorem is true for the base case. 
Now, we must reason about terms formed by subterms. There are four such terms. Such, bread, is zero, and the if then else. Let's just check one of them. The others follow similar reasoning. So, if the term is suck t1, then we assume that the theorem is true about t1. We can do this because t1 is a subterm of suck t1. And we are doing induction on the recursive nature of these terms. So, constant, const of suck t is the same as const t. And size of suck t is, this, is size of t plus 1. Given that const t is no greater than size t by induction, obviously const suck t cannot be greater than size of suck t. And what's interesting is that ordinary induction on natural numbers is just a special case of structural induction. That's because we can define numbers recursively. Here's the definition. So, 0 is a number, and if n is a number, then suck of n is also a number. From this definition, we can define predicates. For instance, to test if a number is 0. So, 0 is even, and if n is even, so is suck of suck of n. And there is a predicate to show what's a double of a number. The double of 0 is 0, and the double of suck of n is suck of suck of the double of n. Let's try to show that the double of a number is always even. We write the theorem in this way. Is even of double of n is true. Right here. Would you like to think about this theorem? How can we prove it? The definitions of is even and double are given below. In the base case, we have n equal to 0, is even of 0 is true, and double of 0 is 0 itself. So, is even of double of 0 is true. And what about the inductive case? Would you like to think about it? We assume that the theorem is true for n. So, what about sug of n? Double of sug of n is suck of suck of double n. And by induction, we know that double n is even. Then if double n is even, applying the third rule of the is-even predicate, this rule here, we get that suck of suck of double n is also even. Let's try to reason a bit about trees. We can define trees like this. An empty node is a tree, and if t1 and t2 are trees, then a node formed by t1 on the left an element, and t2 on the right is also a tree. That's the recursive definition of trees. We can count the number of vertices in a tree using the predicate num v. An empty tree has one vertex. And the number of vertices in a non-empty tree equals the number of vertices in each subtree plus one. And here's a function to count the number of edges in a tree. An empty tree has no edges. And a non-empty tree has two edges plus the number of edges in each subtree. Can you show that the number of vertices in a tree is equal to the number of edges plus one? Below you find all the definitions that are necessary to carry out this proof. If the tree is empty, that's rather easy. Just check each predicate numv and numi for the empty node. But what about the inductive case? Would you like to think about it? You can stop the video and try to reason about trees with a, a node clause. Basically, we assume that the theorem is true for each subtree. We call them t1 and t2, for instance. Then the rest of the theorem follows by a simple algebra. I've copied the developments in this figure in case you want to, to read them. And with this last example, we are done with structural induction. Next class, we start talking about operational semantics properly. Till there, you feel free to write me with questions and comments. Thank you.